Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. Open your Bibles if you have them with you or turn on your device or whatever you use to Romans uh, chapter 8 uh, today. We'll be looking at verses uh, 1 through 11. I'm calling this morning's message of uh, being in Christ Jesus. Um, when I first got here, uh, the first few years, uh, you know, I, I, I let you know that I, I like to preach through books of the Bible, and I began by preaching through the book of James and uh, preached through the book of Colossians and, and, and 1 John, and I've been all over the place. And, and some have, have said, you know, Brother Mike, you really ought to preach through the book of Romans. And uh, my response then was, uh, first of all, uh, you're not ready for me to preach the book of Romans. <laughs> And second of all, I'm not ready to, to preach through the book of Romans. Uh, the, the, the book of Romans is, is deep. It's deep and rich and it's difficult. And there's some things in the book of Romans that are very challenging for us to get our minds around. And, and so what the Lord has led me to do is, is that, that I plan to, uh, over, over time that I'm here with you, is, as the Lord would allow, is to work through chapters at a time. And so that might be a little more uh, workable for us to be able to bear up under. And so... Uh, the Lord led me to, to work through chapter 8 uh, this holiday season. And you're thinking to yourself, well, Brother Mike, it's Christmas. We're supposed to be like in the, the first parts of the Gospels or in, in Luke or Matthew. So what are we doing in Romans 8? Well, I'm glad you asked. And I think that uh, once we're done, uh, once we spend these four weeks in Romans 8, you'll understand the connection between the Christmas story and Romans 8. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see this Clearly. And so this morning we're, look, we're going to look at and begin by thinking about what it means to be in Christ Jesus. And, and some of you say, well, being in Christ Jesus, and, and what Paul will sometimes say, you'll just say in Christ. So what's the difference between being in Christ or being in Christ Jesus? You ready for it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing's different. It's, it's just a different way of saying the, the, the same thing. It, it just simply means to be born again. It means to be saved. It, it means to, to, that, we are to, that we are in union with Jesus. We are in union with Christ Jesus. That's all it means. It means that by our faith in Christ, His righteousness has been imputed to us. It's been given to us. It's been placed in our account. That 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It also means that by faith, his death was our death, right? His death was our death. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It also means that by faith, because he was raised from the dead, we will also be raised from the dead. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. It means that because we have believed in him, we will live with him forever in the kingdom of heaven. That's what it means. And I believe this is one of the most comforting passages in the Bible. In John 14, John 14, 1, to, 1 through 3, you hear it at lots of funerals. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, the whole purpose for Christmas was so we could all be in Christ Jesus. That's right. right that, that's the whole purpose of Christmas. Some of you may be thinking to yourselves, all those verses that I just shared, those are all... Typically, those are Easter passages, Brother Mike. Those are Easter passages, not, not Christmas passages. But you see, here's the thing I want you to understand. Without Christmas, there is no Easter. Amen. Right? Without Christmas, there is no Easter. Without Christmas, there is no imputed righteousness. Without Christmas, there is no death for the atonement of sins. Without Christmas, there is no resurrection. You see, Christmas had to come first. Everything that we celebrate this time of year is essential. Without Christmas, there is no eternal life. In fact, there's only eternal condemnation if Christmas never happened. That's why Romans 8 is the perfect place for us to be at right now in this season to get our minds around what, 
what Christmas is really all about, its benefits and its blessings. You see, the whole world, or most of the world, celebrates Christmas. But not everybody celebrates Christmas for the right reasons. Right. For the same reasons. You see, that, that we celebrate Christmas for a different reason than everyone else because we know what Christmas is about. It matters. You see, we don't need to just keep Christ in Christmas. We need Christ in us. That's right. right? So many people get so aggravated. And I understand. I understand the pushback, the, the cultural issues when people say happy holidays and they, you know, they're, a few years back they wanted to take Christmas, Christ out of Christmas and all that stuff. I get that. I, I get the tension and I get the frustration. But the reality is, it's not just about keeping Christ in Christmas. It's about Christ being in us. That's, that's what matters about Christmas. You see, until you turn from your sins and place your faith in Christ, Christmas will, will just be another holiday on the calendar. That's it. All, all that Christmas will be to you is, is family time and, and maxing out your credit cards and spending time with people that you really don't really care about because you don't talk to them or visit them any other time of the year. That's all it'll be. But once you place your faith in Christ, Christmas will matter. Christmas will, 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 will matter. It will take on an entirely two meaning, to be sure. And so this morning, let's grab our Bibles and let's take a look and stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word together. In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the Spirit, the, the, to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. For you are not, But you are not in the flesh. But in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. This is God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time of year where we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate you keeping your promise to us to send your son to redeem us from the power and the penalty of our sins. God, we rejoice. We rejoice that you are faithful. We rejoice in the salvation that comes through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray. We pray for those who are gathered amongst us here today. Those that are here with us in, in, in person or those who may be watching online, Father, that you would touch hearts today. And for those who do not yet know your son Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that this might be the day of salvation for them. God, work through your word today. Teach us. Help us to understand what it means to be in Christ Jesus. We love you and we ask these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. first truth that we see in our text is that those of us who are in Christ Jesus have been pardoned from the penalty of our sins. We've been pardoned from the penalty of our sins. The, the first four verses says, There is there, therefore no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You see, there's your connection. If you want a connection to Romans 8 and Christmas, there it is. 
right? That they, they God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Previously in, in the book of Romans, in Romans 3, 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that word all means? All. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. And this death is not just physical death, it's spiritual death. And if, if nothing happens, it also means eternal condemnation. This means that, that, that all of us have sinned, and therefore all of us are deserving of being eternally condemned because of our sins. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I'm glad you're here. But that's, that's the reality of our estate. All right? that, that's the reality of who we are. That's what our sin has, 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 has cost us or what we're deserving of because of our sins. You see, that's the, the bad news. Right? We, we always kind of begin with the bad news. But here's the good news. Instead of being eternally condemned, God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in sinful flesh. That He, he was human just like us. That's what Paul wants to make clear. That He wasn't just God. He was God in the flesh. Right? That He lived the perfect life. He was without sin. He, was, he, he looked like us. And he thought like, like us, but he didn't behave like us. He was not a sinner like, like we were. Otherwise, he couldn't have saved us from our sins. That he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh to be condemned in our place so we could be pardoned from the condemnation that we deserve because of our sin. You see, we are all guilty. That's right. either, we're, either we are guilty or we were guilty. And we have been pardoned by faith. You see, when the Son of God came down from heaven, He came down to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what the Bible tells us. But the only way that the Son of God could do that was by living the sinless life that we could not live and by dying the death that we deserved, that we all deserve. We all deserve to be condemned because all of us have sinned against God. In a very real sense, Jesus was born to die. That was the whole purpose of him leaving heaven was to come down and to live the sinless life that we could not live and then die the death that we deserve to pay the price for our sinfulness against God so that we could be reconciled with God by faith. You see, it's only because of what Jesus did for us through his sinless life, his atoning death and his victorious resurrection that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, right? It's not just future condemnation. You're not under condemnation now. When the enemy comes and wants to accuse you and say you're this and you're that and you're worthless and you did this and, and God is angry with you and God couldn't love you, the Bible says you are not condemned anymore. There is no condemnation right. for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation now and there won't be any condemnation throughout all of eternity. Mm -hmm. That's a good place for amen. Yeah. That's amen. That's amen worthy to that know that there's no condemnation. You see, what the works of the law was powerless to do, Christ accomplished. Because he alone could fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. You see, when we talk about the law, we think about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments weren't given as some type of a righteousness checklist. And some people in the church will, will still do that. You know, you'll look at the Ten Commandments and you'll kind of go down through there and well, I didn't steal and I hadn't murdered nobody and so I'm doing pretty good with these commandments. That's not the point. That's right. That was never the point. The Ten Commandments were, were, were given to show us how unrighteous we are because if you can't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, then you're guilty of them all. Right. Right? It's not almost. It's not that you did 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10. It has to be 10 out of 10 or you're guilty. That's what the Bible tells us. God expects and demands and requires perfection, sinless perfection from us, and we cannot do that. The commandments were given. The law was given to show us how unrighteous we are. They were given to show us how desperately we needed a Savior, that we could not save ourselves. Right. And a righteous Savior is precisely what God gave to the world on that first Christmas morning. 
Luke 2, 8 through 11. Here's your, here's your Christmas passage. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, there is nothing that we could do in our own strength to, to redeem ourselves, to redeem us. Right. There was nothing we could do in our own strength about our, our condemnation. But God could and God did. Amen? Amen? God could and God did. There was nothing that we could do to pardon ourselves, but God could and God did. So my question for you before we get too far along in this passage is this, is have you been pardoned? Have you been pardoned from the penalty of your sins yet? You see, well, I, you, some of you may think, well, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on that, that pardon, right? I'm working on it. But you, you see, the truth is you can't earn your pardon. That's right. You can't work on it. You can't work, work your way to a, a, a pardon. You, you, you can't do enough good deeds to earn a pardon. You can't be religious enough to be a pardon. You, you can be sitting in these pews every single Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and, and if you're really, really committed, you, on Wednesday nights even, no matter what, and guess what? Without faith in Christ, you still are not going to receive a pardon for your sins. Amen. It doesn't matter. It can only be received as a gift from God by grace and through faith in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Do you, any of you have problems sleeping at night? And I don't mean because you're sleeping next to someone who makes a lot of noise when they sleep. I'm talking about just this restlessness and just unease and you just, just feel like you're anxious all the time. And they're just, just like there's no peace in your heart. There's no peace in your soul. You're, you're troubled and you have a hard time sleeping. Do you, do you want to be able to live a life of faith instead of a life of fear? Mm -hmm. I think we'd all say, yes, right. I want that. I, I want that. Well, if you want that, you can have that. You can have that through believing in Jesus. That's right. By believing in Jesus and rest in the forgiveness that his death and resurrection purchased for you. Believe in Jesus and be pardoned from the penalty of your, your sins. You see, to not have any condemnation hanging over your head, man, that is a great weight that has been lifted. Mm -hmm. To know that you are at peace with God, you should be able to sleep like a baby because of that alone. I appreciate what Tony Morita said regarding these verses. He says this, he says, The gospel is the reason we can sleep and the reason we can sing, even in the midst of difficulty, the difficulties of life. Mm -hmm. We know our greatest problem has already been solved in Christ. Our greatest problem. We're not, we're not in denial that people have problems. We're not denial, in denial that we have financial issues and marital issues and, and, and issues with, with COVID and all these other things. We're not denying that those things exist. We're just saying that our greatest problem has already been resolved in Christ. Being in Christ Jesus means that we have been pardoned from the penalty of our sins. And there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. What, a, what a blessing. The second truth that we see in our text is that those of us who are in Christ Jesus will have a new pattern of living. All right, that, that we live according to the Spirit. Verses 5 through 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. you all catch that? Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you want to be able to live the kind of life that is pleasing to God? And again... 
I would think everybody sitting in this room would say, yes, I want that. I want, to, I want God to be pleased with me. I want to live a life that's pleasing to Him. But you see, if you do, then you'll need to be in Christ Jesus because that's the only way it's possible. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you cannot live a life that's pleasing to God because only saved people can live according to the Spirit because only people, the people of God, only saved people are filled with God's Spirit. That's what we're told from the Word of God. In fact, living according to the Spirit is evidence that someone has been saved. Right? Living according to the Spirit, it's, it's evidence. How do you know someone's saved? They're living according to the Spirit. They're living a life that's pleasing to God. By believing in Jesus, we have gone from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we have been made new creations in Christ. Right? It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, but behold, all things have become new. When we get saved, not only do we get new hearts, we also get new minds. Right? We get new minds. We, we begin to think differently. That's why the great commandment is to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our what? Our mind. All of our minds, to, to, to be able to live according to the Spirit, we'll need to be constantly filling our minds with God's Word. What does that mean? It means that we need to be reading it. Amen. We need to be studying it, right? We need, we need to be uh, hearing it preached and taught. We need to be studying God's Word. We need to be praying God's Word. Always doing whatever we can to fill our, our hearts and our minds with God's Word. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, before someone comes to faith in Christ, he or she is only capable of living according to the flesh. That's it. That's all that they're capable of because they are carnally minded, that all they have is a a sinful nature. All, all they have is a, the ability to live according to the flesh. An unsaved person is in bondage to their sinful nature. And, and Paul says that what, what that means is they are at enmity with God. Now, we don't use that word very often, but what it means is it's animosity. There's animosity between that person and between God. They don't like God. They, they don't have any desire for God. They're, 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 they're bitter towards God. They're bitter towards God. They're bitter towards God's word. They, they, they don't want to do what God's word says. They, they don't care for God's ways. They don't care for God's people. That's what it means to, to be carnally minded. Have no desire. They have no desire or ability to be subject to the law of God. They stand condemned because of their sins, not just because of their unbelief. Some, some people will think about that. They say, well, why is someone condemned? Why would somebody uh, wind up in hell? That, why would God do that? Why would he condemn? If God is love, why would he send someone to hell? You see, God doesn't send anyone to hell. That's right. We condemn ourselves because of our unbelief, because of our, our sin and our unbelief. We, we, we know this because John 3, 18 through 20 tells us. It says, he who believes in him, talking about Christ, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned when? Already. Already. You see, it's not some future thing. It's, it's already because of sin. You're already condemned. Your unbelief just seals your condemnation. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And so let me just ask you, you're all here this morning on a Sunday morning and you're sitting in church, and that's good. That's a good start. It's where you should be, right? especially if you love the Lord. But, but you, you, see, you can, you can be here under the pretense and say, well, I'm in church, so that makes me a, a Christian. No, no, it does not. It does not make you right with God. Lots of lost people uh, attend church on a, on, on a weekly basis. That There are far too many lost people uh, in our churches, if you, if you want my opinion. People are deceived about their salvation. So how, how can we know? We know by the pattern of their life. So, what, so what's the pattern of your lifestyle? If someone were to 
to, to give you a critique and or someone that knows you well were to, to describe you, how would they describe you? What would the pattern of your life be? Do you practice what is evil or do you practice what is good according to God's word? Right? What, what is the pattern of your life? You see, if you're in Christ Jesus, then your life will bear the good fruit of salvation. Your life will look like Christ lived his life. It would be similar to him or, or becoming more and more like him. The, the pattern of your life will be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, why, why do I use those words? Because that's what the Bible tells us. That's the fruit of the Spirit. We can live according to the Spirit. We know we're living according to the Spirit. It's a power of our lives because that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what God's people do. That should be the pattern of our lives. I believe that love is listed first because, uh, because love is the key to all the rest. If we can't love, if we don't have love within us, we won't, won't do any of the rest of those things either. In fact, it's our love for God and our love for one another that tells the world that we belong to Jesus, that we are in Christ Jesus because of the love that we have. John 13, 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. That's how people will know because of the pattern of our lives. Being Christ Jesus means that the pattern of your life is pleasing to God because you are living according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Amen? Amen? That's what God's Word says. The third truth that we see in our text is that those of us who are in Christ Jesus have the presence of Christ's Spirit dwelling within us. And we see this in verses 9 through 11. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He said, if you don't mind, I want to take us back to the beginning of our Bibles and just kind of work our way through what's what's happening here. Genesis chapter 1 tells us about how God created everything in six days. And I think it's six literal days. Some people want to stretch it out and say, there's no way. It would take, I mean, the experts are, we know about experts now, don't we? We know how credible the experts are. And scientific experts, these historians and these archaeologists, they like to tell us that things are are millions of years old, don't they? Millions and millions of years old. Some say billions of years old. And, they, and so when they read the Genesis account and it says uh, uh, on the first day or the second day and, and, and it was night and then it was the second day, they say that couldn't be just a 24-hour period. It, it, has, it must mean like thousands of years. But I believe what God's Word says is that 24-hour days, little days, six days. Who is the one who created all things? God. It's a miraculous thing. He, he could make it happen. He can do these things. Only God could do this. But Genesis 1 begins and, and tells us that God created everything in six days. Everything means everything. At the end of the six days, God saw that everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. That was his opinion. He said everything was very good. And then in, Je in Genesis chapter 2 rolls around, and we're given more details about the, the creation order and about God's relationship with Adam and in, in the garden. We're, we're told of these things. And then in, in chapter 2 it ends and, and God is taking uh, one of Adam's ribs and, and made for him a wife. Right? We, he makes Eve out of one of his, his ribs. And then uh, you know, in, in, in the chapter 2 ends and says they were both naked and uh, the, the man and his wife and they were not ashamed. You see there was no reason to be ashamed. There was no sin. There was no wickedness. Everything was still perfect. And then chapter 3 happens. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3 comes along. If you're familiar with your Bibles, everything <coughs> falls apart in Genesis right. chapter 3. The serpent came along and tempted Eve to eat of the, free, of, of the fruit of the tree that God had forbid them to eat from. Right? God had, had spoken to Adam and he said, all this is yours. Any, any fruit, any tree, you can eat of, but not that one. 
Not that one and so forth. The servant comes along and says, has God really said? Did God indeed say? Sure, surely that he, he's just holding out on you. So here, try some of this fruit. And of course, Eve says, okay, yeah, you're right. I, th I think you're right. And so took some of the fruit. She ate of it and gave to, to Adam. He was there with her. And, and they both sinned against God. And things fell apart from that point. He ate and everything fell apart. That, that God knew immediately that they had disobeyed him. He knew immediately that, that, that they had sinned against him. Why, how would he know? God knows everything. That's right. He knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He sees everything. You ever heard the phrase secret sin? Mm. It might be secret to us, but it's not secret to him. That's right. God sees and he knows everything. You see, that's what sin is. It's disobedience to God. And the Bible tells us that they would die just like God had warned them what happened. Why? Because that's the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. But, the, but worse than that, far, far worse than that, they were immediately removed from God's presence with no way for them to be reconciled back to Him. At least not yet. At least not yet. Because we are descendants of Adam and Eve, they are what are known as our first parents. Guess what? We are all born with the same nature that they had. Their same fallen nature. We are all born with a sinful nature. And because we have a sinful nature, we all sin. And therefore we all suffer the same exact consequences at Adam and Eve. The same thing. We are, we are no different than they are. And because of our sins, we will die both physically and spiritually because that's the wages of our sin. That's what our sin is deserving of. Because of our sins, we will be separated from God's presence both now and forever unless we repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus. Unless we turn from our sins and place our faith in Jesus as the Savior of the world. You see, only Jesus Christ can reconcile us back to a right relationship with God. You see, only, only Christ can do this. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, church, that's why Christmas matters so much to us as the people of God. That's why Christmas matters so much to us, right? How, how can someone know with certainty that they are in Christ Jesus? Because you, if you're like me, and I, and I ask around, and I talk to people, and, and I ask them, you know, are you a Christian? Almost everybody I meet I don't know if it's because I'm a pastor or, or what it is. Almost everyone I meet will say they're Christians. Right? And, and yet our churches look like this. Right? How can that be? How can it be that everybody in our community is a Christian and, and, and most of our churches, it's not just us. It's not just us with all this empty spaces in our sanctuaries. I ask around my pastor friends, they're dealing with this too. And, and even the big churches, you know what happens in big churches? Big churches have more space because they're bigger. They have more empty chairs and more empty pews than we do. But everybody says that they, they all say that they're Christians, that they all, uh, all follow after Jesus. So how can we know? How can we know if someone is in Christ Jesus or not? We can know because we, because we or they have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within. We have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within. With us, with us, Paul doesn't deal in speculations like many people in the church tend to do, right? We tend to, to want to, to give people the, the, the benefit of the doubt, and I understand that. But look, if there is no evidence of someone being saved, then stop saying they're saved. Mm -hmm. Stop making excuses for your unsaved grandchildren. Stop making excuses for your unsaved children. Stop making excuses for your unsaved husband or your wife. You're not doing them any favors. You're aiding and abetting their lostness. You're, you're feeding their delusion of being saved when they're not saved. How do you know that they're saved? Not because of the pattern of their lives. That's right. How are they living? What does the evidence show you? You see, Paul doesn't deal with speculation. He, he deals with facts. He believes the evidence. He believes what he sees. Either you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you, or you don't. That's it. Either you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you or you don't. Either you're, you are in Christ Jesus or you're not. It really is that simple. It really is. 
Verse 9 literally tells us, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. That's right. You don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. So how do we know if we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within us? Paul just told us how we can know in verses 5 through 8. We just looked at it. We just saw it with our own eyes. Our, our minds will be set on the things of the Spirit, and therefore we will, be, we will be living lives that are according to the Spirit. And of course, our lives will bear the fruit of the Spirit as well. We'll always strive to live in a way that's pleasing to God. That's how we know. Are, are you striving day by day to, to live in a way that's pleasing to God? That, that's that's the, the question. Is, is what I'm doing today pleasing to God? Am I trying to live in a way that's pleasing to God? That's how we know. See, there's a lot of people that are walking around claiming to be Christians when their lifestyles give no evidence that they have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within them. No evidence at all. Let's say they love Jesus. Love Jesus. That, that, that they're, they're born again, but they have no desire for the things of God or being with God's people. Unfortunately, unless something happens and they truly get saved, when they meet Jesus at the judgment, they're going to be in for a rude awakening. You know what they're going to hear when they see Jesus at judgment? Mm -hmm. Depart from me. I never knew you. Mm -hmm. Depart from me. I never knew you. And you see, then it's going to be too late. This will be too late. It ain't going to be no, well, let me get right now. It's too late to get right then. Right. Today is the time to get right. Today is a get right day. If you're here, today is the day of salvation for you. Right. Time to stop pretending. Time to stop playing games. Time to get right. Time to be in Christ. Listen now, John MacArthur explains what is being said in these verses. He always does a better job than I do. He says, the person who gives no evidence of the presence, power, and fruit of God's Spirit in his or her life has no legitimate claim to Christ as Savior and Lord. The person who demonstrates no desire for the things of God and has no inclination to avoid sin or passion to please God is not indwelt by the Holy Spirit and thus does not belong to Christ. A phrase that stuck out to me in that, in that quote was this, that they have no legitimate claim to Christ. Again, as I said earlier, lots of people claim to know Christ. They claim to, to belong to Christ, but they're, they're, the, the, the pattern of their, their life, the absence of the presence of God's Spirit, reveals that they have no legitimate claim. You can claim all that you want and still not be legitimate. You see, if you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you, you will have a strong desire to live for Christ. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you, then you won't. You won't. You, you, you simply won't. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, if we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within us, not only will we live for Christ in the here and now, but we will also live with Christ for all of eternity. Amen. We will be with Him for all of eternity. Amen? Amen? We will be with Him from now on. And In fact, that's the promise of verse 11. Paul says, if, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So let me just ask you, is the presence of Christ dwelling within you? Is the presence of Christ dwelling within you? Is His Spirit dwelling within you right now? So I tend to strongly agree with Robert Mounts and what he said on this matter. He says this, he says, whether or, whether or not a person is indwelt by the Spirit is truly a life and death matter. It's a life and death matter. I, I, I would say even more specifically, it's an eternal life or an eternal death matter. It matters. What we do with Jesus. Being in Christ Jesus means that not only are we in Christ, it means that Christ is in us too by a spirit. Amen? Amen? So this morning as we close our time together to answer the question this morning, what does Romans 8 have to do with Christmas? 
Now you know. Romans 8 has everything to do with Christmas. All the way back in Genesis 3, right after God confronted Adam and Eve about their sin against him, he pronounced judgment on the serpent. Of course, we know the serpent is representative of Satan. Right? Listen to what Genesis 3, 14 and 15 says, or more specifically, pay attention to verse 15. It says, So that the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you know, because you have tempted Adam and Eve to sin against me, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, that he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, verse 15 is what's known as the proto-evangelium. I always get that wrong. You so say, that's a, a big, long, fancy word, and it is, but what, 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 it, what it says is this. It's just a fancy way of saying it's the first mention of the gospel. It's the first mention of the, the good news within the, the, the pages of Scripture. From the very beginning, God had planned, had a plan in place to defeat sin, death, and hell. Right? This, this, is, this didn't catch God off guard. He was aware of what was going to happen. That the seed of the woman was referring to Jesus and his, and his virgin birth to, to, to Mary. You see, Christmas was just phase one. That's all it was. That Christmas was phase one of God's plan to redeem fallen humanity. You know, we talk about Jesus dying for the sins of the world, and that's true. He did. It was necessary. Jesus died for the sins of the world and rose again, again three days later. But you see, he had to come down from heaven first. He had to come down from heaven first. That, that John 1, 14 uh, says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It also says that he did so without sin. So it could be sacrificed for us. Right. You see, without Christmas, there is no Easter. Without Christmas, there is no Easter. Without Christmas, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no imputed righteousness. There is no death for the atonement of sins. There is no resurrection. There is no eternal life. There is only eternal condemnation. You see, that's why Romans 8 matters. That's why Romans 8 matters. Praise God for him keeping his promise that, that, that he made for us in, Rome, in, in Genesis 3.15. He's a promise-keeping God, and he promised that he would redeem us, and that's exactly what he has done. You see, if you didn't know already, now you know why Christmas matters so much to Christians and why Romans 8 is the perfect passage to preach this Christmas season. So let me just ask you again. I, I got lots of questions this morning. Right? Why, why does Christmas matter to you? Right? What, what gets you excited about Christmas? Again, as I started out, some of you get excited because it's family time. And, and that's a good thing. It's good to have family gather around and have a house full of family and, and you don't see them very often. And that's great. That's wonderful. That is a gift of God to be sure. But you see, that's, what, that's, that's not... The ultimate reason why Christmas should matter so, to you or to any of us. Or, or more importantly, let me just, just jump right to it and ask you this. Are you in Christ Jesus? That's what matters. That's right? Right. This, this Christmas, any Christmas, any day of the year, that's what matters is whether you're in Christ Jesus or not. Have you been pardoned from the penalty of your sins? Right. That's, that's what matters today. Have you been pardoned from the penalty of your sins? Do you live according to the Spirit or, or according to the flesh? You see, that's, that's what matters right now. That's what matters today. Do you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you? Because you see, that's ultimately what matters. You see, if you can honestly say yes, if you have a, a legitimate reason to say yes to all these questions, then, then I praise the Lord for you. I praise the Lord for you, and I praise the Lord for your salvation. But if not, today can be the day of your salvation. That's right. Today can be your get-right day. Today can be the day that you are pardoned from the penalty of your sins. Today can be the day that you start living according to the Spirit instead of according to the flesh. You can be made a new creation today, is what the Bible tells us. Today can be the day that the Spirit of Christ begins to dwell within you. Today, everything can change for you today. It doesn't matter how you came in here. God can change you. God can make you new today. 
Today has the potential to be the best day of your life, but that's going to depend on what you decide to do with Jesus. It's going to depend on you. You see, God's not going to make you believe anything. He gives us a free will to choose for ourselves. You see, again, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the invitation for you. If you have not placed your faith in Jesus, today is the day to get right. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you for this day that you've made. <clears throat> God, we ask that you work in our hearts, work in our minds. We thank you for the gift of salvation that you've offered today. God, I pray that, that we would all understand what Christmas is really all about. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of life. Father, we ask that you stir our hearts and our minds today. For those who belong to you, God, help us to rejoice. Rejoice that we are in Christ Jesus. And Father, for those who are not yet in Christ, we ask that today that it would be their get right day. That they would turn from their sins. Stop playing games. Stop pretending. And place their faith in Jesus. Do a work in all of us today. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.